Very good. Thanks, Kenneth. Um, yeah, let's start. Welcome, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. We're going to have some fun debugging um, on Embedded Linux. So let me first um, introduce myself and work with Embedded for 25 plus years now. I'm located in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, I've been working with my company for 12 plus years now. I do consulting and training uh, for customers um, in Brazil and also in have a few customers in Europe and in the US. Um, I'm also an open source contributor, a cardinal, I would say, uh, um, Beauty Root, Yocto, uh, the Linux kernel, and a few other open source projects. You can, <clears throat> sorry, follow me um, on LinkedIn. You can find me there, uh, Twitter, and also you can um, follow my blog, sergioparado.blog. So our agenda, I'm going to quickly introduce this talk, debugging. And I'm going to talk about some um, the most important techniques and tools to debug any kind of software. Of course, our focus here, here is in Beta Linux. And I hope to have lots of hands-on during the presentation. Um, any bugs are intended for this presentation. Hopefully, we don't have unintended bugs. Let's see. Um, well, the, what is the bug, right? The bug is the process of identifying solving bugs. That's errors, software, harder. And I found that this topic is very fascinating because this is something that we usually don't learn, right, in school. <laughs> but that's something that we do almost every day. Um, so that's something that's kind of improved over time, right? Um, and uh, one of the ideas of this presentation is to try to understand, like, there are several different ways and techniques and process to debug. Um, there is one very common that is adding prints to the code. And when we start our career, that's something that we do. But uh, over time, um, we learn other techniques that are usually more productive so let's let's talk about this in this presentation um it's hard to say like try to find out a, a good process for debugging software it's like you are a detective right um and usually you are also the the one that you're searching for right the, the criminal <laughs> you are the criminal and detective at the same time because you are searching for bugs in the software that you wrote. But anyways, um, usually I follow the, the, the this process to the bug, uh, any kind of uh, software error. I first try to understand the problem. That's very important, right? Um, let's say you are having a kernel ops or a kernel panic. Um, you need to understand that. You need to understand what a kernel panic is. You need to understand how to analyze a kernel ops message. So if you don't understand that, um, it's going to be more difficult for you, right, to find out the issue. So that's the first part. And then the second step would be try to reproduce the problem. That is also very important because if you cannot reproduce the problem, um, how will you say that you solve it in the end, right? So we need, you, before you even start working on the problem, you need to find out a way to reproduce it. Sometimes it's very easy, right? Like you run a software and it crashes. So it's easy to reproduce. But sometimes not that easy. You might like have um, intermittent problems. And then you're going to have to find a way to reproduce the intermittent problem. So it's not sometimes it's not that easy. But that's an important part of the debugging process. And the third step would be to identify the root cause. So now you understand what is happening. Uh, the kernel is crashing. Um, now you can reproduce the problem. Like if you write to this file, then the kernel crashes. And then now you're going to 
try to find out the root cause. That's usually what takes most of your time, right? Searching for the bug. As soon as you find the root cause, then it's a manual process of applying the fix or the possible fix, because sometimes you don't know if that's the correct fix. Sometimes it's a try and everything. And if it fixes it, because you know how to reproduce, or if you cannot reproduce anymore, then you are in theory good to go. If not, you're gonna get to get back to the first step and start again. So this is kind of a process, right? To debug any kind of problems in software. Um, also, I, I usually classify software problems in five categories. Um, you might find out another category, I don't know, but uh, usually you can take any kind of bug and, and classify in one of these five categories. Uh, crash problems, that's when the software just crashes. Crash is a kind of uh, unexpected, um, uh, it stops execution, right, abruptly. Um, it might be because usually like user, user application crashes because of uh, invalid memory access. Then you have the segfault, segmentation, fault error. But you, have, you might have other reasons for crashes like uh, invalid instruction, the software tried try to execute an invalid instruction, um, another kind of like a division by zero on some architectures that will crash the software and so on. Uh, the kernel might also crash, right? With a kernel panic, for example. Um, lookups, hangs, another category of error. So the software just hangs. When I when I say here the software could be the kernel in our like case we're talking about an embedded Linux system where I have the Linux kernel and then user space applications, so uh, the kernel might hang because of some bug in the kernel, or a user app application might also hang, so that's another type of error. For example, let's say you have a multi-thread application, and because of some kind of a deadlock issue in the application, right? Um, the application might hang, like two spreads waiting for the mutex to be released by the other thread and then you have a deadlock. Um, another type of error, logic or implementation. Um, so any software is a kind of system, right? Where you have your inputs, some kind of processing in the output. Um, so this kind of error, everything's kind of working, but the output's not expected, it's not what you expect. So it's a logic problem or an implementation problem. Fourth type of error, resource leakage. So it leaks resource for some reason. The most common resource that leaks in software usually is memory, especially if you are working with uh, dynamic allocation, right? you might have problems if you don't have a kind of garbage collector, that stuff. But you might leak other resources. For example, you open a file and forget to close that file. Right? If you stay in a loop, open a file without closing it, then you might end up with no file descriptors for you because you are leaking file descriptors. The kernel cannot allocate for you file descriptors anymore. Last type of error in my five uh, major categories is lack of performance or performance issues. So everything is working, but um, you are using too much memory or too much CPU. Um, of course, this is very relative, right? Like you have a software running on an embedded Linux device with, uh, I don't know, um, 256 megs of RAM. Um, if you take the same software and runs in a PC with dozens of memory, you might not, not have a performance issue, but if you have if you run it on an embedded Linux device, you might. Um, so usually the performance issue is relative to the to the system that you are running on the software. Or not, right? You might really have a kind of a problem um, in the application or in the kernel that are causing the, the usage of too much CPU or memory or maybe energy and so on. 
Very good. And uh, I also usually like say that we have uh, five tools or techniques to to solve this kind of problems. Um, I would say the first and probably the most important tool it's our brain. Uh, that means your knowledge, not only the knowledge but also the skills, right? Um, you need to understand and also know how to apply that understanding. And um, that's important. That's a tool that's always, or we should always keep improving it. Another technique very important to the bug software is post-mortem analysis. It's a kind of technique where you do analysis of some kind of information that you extracted from the device. Like logging, you might extract the kernel logs to see what's going on at the kernel space, or you might extract um, a user space log, let's say journal D or something else. Um, you might create dumps from memory to analyze later. Um, for example, you can generate a core dump from an application that is crashing and then do the analysis. Tracing profiling is another technique for debugging. And um, adding print in the code, it's in, inside that category. So probably most, most of us know how to do tracing. Um, because when you add print to the code, you are tracing the code with your own messages. Uh, but the point here is that there are several, um, there are, there is an infrastructure in the kernel and also several tools and frameworks in user space to trace applications without the need to add messages to the application. So that's important. And I'm gonna talk about this during this presentation. Um, another tool technique to debug, it's the interactive debugging, um, like GDB. So GDB is a tool that allows us to um, interactively debug the software. You can uh, stop the execution, run the code line by line, and so on. That's another way to debug software. And last but not least, there are several, I usually call it frameworks or debugging frameworks to debug software. Uh, one very known, Debug frameworks called Valgrind to debug memory related problems. So, those are tools that are created so you can um, debug better on a specific kind of problem. Um, so, my idea now is to show you examples on each one of these types of techniques. So we're going to see problems and uh, how to apply those techniques for those kind of problems. So I'm going to start. So I'm going to go. So I'm going to start with postmortem, and then after that, tracing, interactive debugging, and debugging frameworks. And let's see how it goes. I'm planning to do lots of hands-on here. So we're going to see my terminal. And um, hopefully everything will work well. Um, we're gonna have access to the slides later. Everything that we're gonna do here in the terminal, it's on the slides. Of course, you can write anything you want, but uh, everything is in the slides. You can check it out later um, if you want. But uh, I think it's nice instead of just staying in the in the slides, just open the terminal and, and play with it. So post-mortem analysis is a kind of a technique where you do the analysis um, after the bug happened. So it's, uh, you're going to need some way to collect information from the device to analyze later. Uh, this information can be logs, right? Like logs from the kernel, logs from a, a user space application, or it can be dumps from memory. Um, there is a way to create, for example, a dump from the Linux kernel. Uh, there is a group of tools called KDump, and a system call from the kernel called KeyExec. 
that allows you to do that, create a coin dump from the loop kernel. But we're not going uh, to talk about this. We're going to see here um, coin dump in the new place application and also how to analyze a kernel ops message. Um, I usually say that uh, post mortem analysis is a very good technique to analyze crashes and logic problems. That's usually very useful for those two kinds of uh, problems. Let's see here a few examples. Uh, we don't have much time to go over like every detail, but I hope um, I'm gonna focus here on the most important things and I hope that will be useful for you. If later you want more information about any specific part of this presentation, you can just write me. Um, so a kernel crash. I have here this board, as you can see, on my camera. I'm running here um, a small embedded Linux system that I created with BuildRoot. I'm doing the boot over network. So everything is over network. Um, it's downloading the kernel and the device tree and mounting the root file system, everything over the network. Um, should be fast to debut because it's a very small system. All right, let me know if the size of the font is not good for you or if you cannot see it. Uh, the first situation I'm going to show you it's a kernel. Oops, so I'm gonna I added a few bugs, okay, in the kernel and also in the in the files in the in the user space. Uh, in some user space applications. Um, so there is a bug in the kernel. If I connect a uh, USB stick, the kernel crashes. Nice. So this is a kernel crash. Um, don't be afraid of kernel crashes. There are lots of useful information here. Um, since there are only numbers, right? But no, there are lots of useful information here. So this is the beginning of the kernel ops message. This is a kernel ops message. This is the beginning. In the first line, we can see the reason of the crash, unable to handle new pointer the reference. Nice. As soon as uh, kernel developers convert everything to Rust, we're not going to have this problem anymore, right? But I'm not sure that will happen uh, soon, at least. Anyway, um, so there is a wild pointer there in the software, in the, in the kernel that is causing this. Um, more useful information here. Here we can see the location of the program counter. This kind of information really depends on the architecture. So if you are running this on x86 or MIPS or PowerPC or any other architecture, this is ARM 32 bits. You might see different registers, right? But the information will be there. So this is the program counter and this is the location of the crash. You have the name of the function and you have the index inside the function that causes the crash. You can use this to find out the line of code that causes the crash. Here you also have the address of in memory that causes the crash. That's basically the same thing as this information here. The address, this is the function plus index, and the address is the same thing. Um, and below we have the backtrace. That's the functions that uh, were called until the crash. So k-thread, call it worker thread, that call it process one work, that call it hub event, going up to here, that crash. So this might be useful for you to debug like all of the functions that was, that were called. Nice, how can we debug this? So to debug this, we need the three things. We need the, the source code of the Linux kernel. We need tools from the tool chain. Um, there are two tools that you can use here, GDB and ADGR to line. 
Um, and uh, you need, we need the, 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 the kernel image in ELF format with the bugging symbols. I have here um, all of this. So this is the kernel source code. I have the kernel with the bugging symbols here. This is this VM Linux file is the kernel image uh, in ELF format. That's not the image that we boot, um, but it, it is generated when you build a kernel. And here we can see that this ELF file has the bugging symbols. That means you can convert that, those addresses to symbols like line addresses. Let's do this. So one tool to do this is um, ADDR to line. Um, you can see that I'm using my cross compiler tool chain, right? You need to use your cross compiler tool chain, you, the tool chain you use it to build the kernel. Um, and uh, I'm going to pass here dash F to see the function. I, I what I want to do is to convert that addresses that address what is the address here of the crash here so i want to convert this address to a line of code so i take in the address of the program counter and then i'm gonna pass dash e the kernel image and the address oops sorry here we go so now i have storage probe that's the function where the crash can happen, the source code and the line. So now I can open this. Let's open this file. Oops. One, 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 eight. This is the line that crash. And uh, if you want to see why, we can see that this unusual dev pointer is new here. And it was not initialized. And so yeah, I added that code there to crash. Right? But you could see like how easy it was to um, to find out the line of code that caused the crash. Sometimes it's not that easy to find the root cause. That's two different things. One thing is to find out the line of code that caused the issue, and the other thing is to find out why that line is crashing. In this case, it was kind of easy. Uh, but it might not be that easy, right? But it's like it's better than just open the kernel that's 30 million lines of code and starting adding prints to it. Much better. So this was a kind of uh, example on doing post multi analysis in a kernel code. I want now to show another example on doing this on a user space application. So I have here an application. Again, everything that I have done here in the terminal, it's in the slides, right? So you can see all of the comments here. And you're going to be able to refer to the presentation later. It's going to be on YouTube, so you can watch it later again if you want to review this process. Um, I have another example here. So I have this FPing application that is crashing. Let's see if I can. Checking if we have any questions, not. Oops, it's in a boot loop, probably because I forgot to remove the pen drive <laughs> and it's crashing every time it boots. There are a couple of questions um, oh, yeah? okay. about uh, the first question is I did answer that question, but you can add your uh, uh, take on it as well. The more you test, less you debug. Am I wrong? That was the first question. Um, uh, I wouldn't I would not say like the more you test, the um, less bugs you have, but I would say the better is your test coverage, mm -hmm. then for sure, uh, less bugs you have in the code. Because sometimes you test, but you test the wrong thing, um, or you not cover everything from the software. So there are several ways that these talks not focus on um, 
uh, avoiding uh, adding bugs to the code or preventing from adding bugs to the code, right? But uh, like working with unit tests and and doing um, tests before release. I mean, I mean, there are several different techniques that you could apply to prevent from adding bugs to the code. Uh, it's impossible to not add any bugs to the code. I mean. Uh, probably the only code that doesn't have bugs, bugs the code that doesn't have any lines. But um, the more you cover your software from the testing per perspective, the better for sure will be yeah, the quality of the code. Yeah. So there is another question about, uh, I think the material um, uh, that the image, uh, let me see what the question is. Can we get training materials such as source and images for the steps that you are showing, I think? Um, that's probably the question, the image. Yeah, yeah, this actually this uh, talk is part of my training on debugging and everything is open. So um, I can provide you with links so you can install this material um, and try for yourself. Um, I'm using here a toilet X board and uh, for you to run all of those hands on, you're going to probably need um, this uh, development board or adapt to, I don't know, Raspberry Pis or any other maker boards. But I'm can, I can share with all of you if you want. Um, I, I'm going to send um, the, the slides with the, the, the links for my training and then you, yeah. You think you you can uh, you think you can uh, share the link to the with the with the slides? Yeah, we can we can definitely share the links. Definitely. Okay. Um, so you can just include it in the slides, and we'll share. And the other question oh, is yeah. how uh, how to debug issues that are difficult to reproduce on systems um, we have, but uh, uh, something that's found on a different system meaning a driver works perfectly on one hardware, but it doesn't on mm -hmm. another um, socks. And then also, what if these are remote? Yeah, um, yeah. in that case, you can just blame the hardware, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a tricky question. I mean, usually when I have this kind of uh, intermittent issues, like you, you can reproduce this issue here, but not there, or uh, the, the issue will only happen on sunny days. Um, uh, in that kind of situation, what I try to do is to create or write tools to um, improve, like make it easier for the issue to happen. Because it's usually like you have to play with statistics, right? Um, so that is this issue in this protocol that happens every like 20 messages that you send or something like this. So. Uh, with some tools and automation, you might want to improve or increase the possibility of the issue to happen. And then you leave the tool running, like for several hours or maybe days, to create this kind of statistical data. Like I ran my tool for three days and then I got three times the issue. And then you have this data, like we're going to work with this. And then you, you work on fixes and keep running your tool until you, you cannot see the issue anymore. And then after that, you go to production with that fix and see if it's working. I mean, it's kind of tricky, right, to work with those kind of uh, intermittent issues to try to understand what is the root cause of the problem. Very good. Um, so I want to show you now the another situation where we do post-mortem analysis. So this is uh, an application that is crashing. Of course, I added this crash. <laughs> and um, how can we debug that? So we could start here a GDB session. That could also be effective. But I'm going to do it post-mortem analysis. So what I want to do here is to um, create a core dump of the application. A core dump is a kind of a snapshot of the application that crashes. So let's do that. There is a tool, call it ULimit, that uh, makes it possible to configure the limits of an application, um, like uh, how many threads you can create, how many files you can open, and that stuff. So one of the limits is the size of the cordon. 
And then you can configure that with the dash C parameter. By default, it's zero. Of course, it depends on your system, on your distribution, for example. But if you don't change it, by default, the configuration is zero. So I'm, I want to increase that to unlimited. So that means unlimited, sorry. So now I can create unlimited cordant files. That might be a problem for an embedded Linux system because let's say the application is running one gig of memory, is using one gig of memory. That means the, the core dump will be of that size. So you need a space to create that file in your system. But I mean, here in my specific case, uh, this is no problem because I'm, all of my file system is over network. So I, I have an unlimited space to store files. Um, now I'm going to run the application again. You're going to see that the core was dumped. So that means now I have here a core file. This file, this is an L file, but basically a snapshot of the memory of the process that crashed. Now I can take this file and on my host machine analyze it. So let's do that. Um, what I need to do that. So here, well, I'm building my system with build root as a build system. And um, to, the, to, to analyze the core dump, what I need is the source code of the application. I need my two chain, of course, and I'm going to use the GDB for that. Um, and uh, I also need the binary with the bugging symbols. On build root, I have everything under output build and the application. So everything is here. I think my source is inside, my binary is inside SRC. So this is the binary generated by build root with the bugging symbols. And I have the source code here and the binary so I can do everything here. So how to do this core dump analysis? I'm going to start. First of all, I need a core dump. So I'm going to um, get that file from the target to the host. But since all my file system is inside this directory here, so it's it's already on my machine because I'm booting over a network. This is the root file system. It's already on my machine. And uh, the core dump is here, I would say. Yeah, this is the core dump. So I'm going to copy this file here. I need to add permit to add the permissions to my user to this file because by default it's only only by root. Now I have the file here, the core file that was created on the device and I'm going to do a post mode analysis on the host. Then I'm just going to open GDB with this file. So I start GDB with the application and the core dump, dash C, core. So what GDB will do is just stop, like show me the line of code, the last line of code that was executed. That's the line of code that caused the crash. Here we can see the issue, the problem. Program terminated with six seg v. That's a sign that the kernel sent to the application um, because the application accessed an invalid memory addresses. And that's the line of code that caused the crash. OptiPars line 217. Um, uh, sorry, there is one question probably relevant yeah. to answer now. Is it possible mm -hmm. to specify where to save the cold dump file? Yes, exactly. It is possible there is a file, I'm not sure if I mentioned here. Um, yes, it's here. So that is this proxies kernel core pattern that you can use to specify information about where you want to generate this file, the name of the file, and so on. 
uh, I think the specifics of this question is uh, um, they are running application running on a Docker container and would like to save the cold dump in a volume shield with the host. I think that's kind of what you have on your setup right now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that will not change the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there is a nice feature from GDB that I like. That's the TUI mode because it shows you a better view of the source code. So if we start GDB with dash TUI, you can see like a window with the source code, and that is nice, right? So here you can see like the line that crashed, and then and here you can also see the same line, uh, two, one, seven. And um, another thing nice about the core dump is that you can really inspect the memory because it's a snapshot of the memory. So you can print stuff like I want to to see what is the value of these options pointer print options, and then you can see and not new so probably it was not that one that caused the crash we can print the value of the argv pointer inside of this option pointer to see if it's new and we can see it is zero no that means that was the pointer that caused the crash uh we, we can actually actually print the complete structure here options uh print if i reference the, this pointer i can see the complete content of the structure so as you can see uh, we really have access to the content of the memory and i can do a backtrace um to see like main call it this function this function crash it. i can go to main like frame one and go to main and then i can see the the call to that function that crashed so I really can inspect the software. Of course, I cannot run the software here, right? That's what that's why you're doing like it's a post-mort analysis. You are not doing an interactive debugging session. I'm gonna do that in a few um moments, but not now. So this is a post-mort analysis. It's very useful for cases where you don't have access to the device. Uh you ask someone, can you please just like run those comments, generate the card up and send it to me, then I can analyze here. That may, might be very useful. What there is one question about a GDB shows up. Uh, sometimes GDB shows optimized out. Why? Yeah. I'm going to post that um, for everybody. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's because um, when, you, when you compile the software with optimizations flags, the compiler we optimize the code. That means the compiler might remove lines of code because it thinks it doesn't need to run or might um, reorder some instructions to improve, let's say, the, the speed of the software or the size. So if you compile the software with any kind of uh, optimization flags, you might have problems. Um, in that case, uh, what I usually recommend, try to debug with optimization on, because that's what it is running, right, on your production system. But if that's causing you problems, like you really want to see this or that and the compiler optimizes that, then you're going to have to turn off the optimizations or decrease the optimization level. Usually on the, on GCC, so if you open the GCC man page, you're gonna see those dash o um, options. This is uh, nowadays the recommended flag to build the software with um, a same set of optim optimization level that doesn't impact the bugging, the dash o g. But you might build a software with like dash o3, for example, or dash os that improves the size of the binary, and that might impact the bugging. It's a trade off. So there is another question Can we detect a memory leakage using GDB like Valgrind? GDB uh, and Valgrind, probably? 
Um, I never use a GDB to debug uh, leaks. Um, I'm gonna show you in a in a few slides how to do that with Valgrind. I feel that most of the time you're gonna gonna use Valgrind for that kind of uh, problems. Um, the trade-off is Valgrind will run the software slowly, um, but um, let me get there because I'm gonna talk about Valgrind. Um, and then you might ask again, if that doesn't answer your question. But so we saw a few examples on doing, um, um, on debugging using this post-mortem analysis. Um, I'm not sure how we are on the on time-wise. Um, we are kind of in the in the middle of the presentation, so let me let me know if I should go faster or not. Uh, but hopefully you are enjoying um, tracing. Trace is another technique to debug software. It's a kind of a specialized um, type of logging, right? Uh, tracing enables you to trace the execution of the software and also. Um, do some kind of uh, runtime analysis. Uh, you can measure the execution of functions. You can measure latencies because you are tracing like all functions and that stuff. There are different uh, techniques and frameworks to implement tracing. Uh, there are static. There are two kinds of like when you do trace, you, you add the trace points in the code. When you add a print to the code, you are doing a static, you are adding a static trace point to the code. Uh, and in the Linux kernel, for example, there are frameworks to do dynamic tracing. That means you can dynamically at runtime, not at build, build time, at runtime, you can add trace points in kernel space and in user space. That's very nice. And um, Trace is very useful for different kind of problems, but uh, when you want to measure performance, it helps. When you want to measure latency, it also helps. Lookups, the software is just locking up like some reason. Um, Tracy might help because you can identify like the function that freezes the execution. I want to show you here a few examples. Um, so at kernel space, that is a nice framework. Call it ftrace. You can do everything with ftrace. So ftrace is a infrastructure in the kernel for tracing. And um, here in this example, I'm tracing an application that is taking a while to execute. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you like what it is using. Then I'm going to show the bug. So to, to use ftrace, what you have to do is go to the kernel, like let me open here the kernel configuration menu, and then you go to this very nice menu called it kernel hacking. And then there are several nice features there. Uh, if you have some time, go there and see. And then there is this menu, tracers. If you enable tracers, you're gonna enable ftrace. And then there you have several different traces to trace the execution of uh, the Linux kernel, not only the Linux kernel, but also user space applications. And then if you enable that, you're gonna have uh, the, the basic interface to have traces a file system, and then you can just mount it TraceFS, usually we mount at this directory, syskernel tracing. And then you're gonna see there several files to enable tracing. I'm gonna show you a quick example of how that works. Uh, so we have here, for example, this file called available tracers. And those are the traces that I enable for this kernel. And then I'm gonna enable this one, function graph tracer. It's going to show me all of the functions executed at the kernel space uh, in a graph view. So to enable that, I have to write the name of the tracer 
to this current tracer file. Now it's enabled. Now it is happening. The kernel is tracing itself and writes into a buffering memory um, that we can see with this trace pipe file. So here, what we are seeing is all of the kernel functions being executed. This might be very useful because you don't need to like to to try to print to the code like I'm I'm executing this function now I'm executing this function because it's everything here you don't need to do anything and and there are several files here because it's lots of information but you can filter by process you can filter by function by subsystem by events so you can really play a lot with this. Um, here is an example of using ftrace to debug an application that is taking a lot to execute. So um, I added a bug to the core co to the kernel code where if you try to um, a blink a LED, like enabling, um, turning on an LED, it's taking four seconds. Usually it doesn't take four seconds, right, to blink an LED. So that is something going on here. Then I mounted ftrace. Then here I'm using a command called tracemd. This is a command to make it easier to use ftrace because I could write directly to those files, but uh, I would need to write to several files to do this tracing. And tracemd do, would just do that for me. Uh, I'm asking tracemd uh, to do a function graph tracing of this command. And then it will run the command. It will trace the kernel and generate a dead file for me with all of the functions executed by the kernel. And then I can take this um, trace file and ask TraceMD to generate a report for me, to parse it and then show me in a human readable way. And then I'm just redirecting that to a log and then catching the log. And then I'm going to see all of the kernel functions executed when I run that command. And here I can see if I now do some analysis on this, I can see that uh, this function, call this function, that call this msleep function, that took four seconds to run. So I can see here the cause of that uh, delay in the execution, an msleep call inside this function. I didn't have to do anything, just enable ftrace, generate the, the tracing, and then do some analysis on the data. I can do that also with a graphical tool called kernel shark. Very nice. Um, so if, for those that like graphical applications, I mean, there are some nice graphs here about CPU usage and uh, the functions that were called. I mean, you have the same information here, but you can filter, do that stuff that you can do with graphical application. If you want to learn more about um, ftrace, I would recommend um, Steven's talks. Those are always very funny. So just go to YouTube and search for ftrace you're gonna for sure find several talks about steven and they're gonna have some fun with uh, tracing the kernel with ftrace i have a few questions uh yeah. would you like to take them now um yeah yeah let's do it why not it's about if it's about yeah this talk. okay so sometimes you get core file from production with optimized values on error line. Uh, there is no way to reproduce this. Then what to do? Cry. Um, well, if you have a core, a core dump, it's a, a snapshot of the memory. And um, if the software that you run um was compiled in uh, some kind of optimization level um where you cannot really like match the line of code 
uh, with the memory, with the, the, the memory addresses. That, that is really not much you can do, but try to reproduce the problem later and generate another core dump with the application without the optimizations lab. Or at least I, I'm not sure, I, I, I don't know how you would debug in this kind of situation, right? It's, it's always a trade-off, right? The, like, um, the, if you want to improve security, usually you decrease the bugability. Um, if you want to improve research usage, usually you, you decrease the level of the bugability you have. Uh, it's harder to debug. Um, and there is not much we can do, right? Sometimes we try to find a good balance between, between those. But usually, uh, as far as my knowledge goes, there is not much you can do but try to reproduce the problem later with a different level of uh, optimization where you can really debug that, that software. So the second question is GDB is for user space only. Can we debug kernel no. via GDB? <laughs> Let's do it in a moment. Okay, we'll do that. So after commercials. Can Valgrind catch dynamic library memory leaks? Uh, yes. So Valgrind will um, basically um, uh, simulate the software. And um, if the leak is happening at the mem at, at the library level, and um, Valgrin will be able to see that. Now, if Valgrin will be able to find out the symbols from the library that's causing the leak, then that depends on if you have the library with the bugging symbols installed on the target. Um, I'm going to also talk a little bit about that on the Valorant talk. So I think the other question we have is, it's worth mentioning that Ubuntu and comp uh, other distros have tracing support usually enabled. Yes, some of them do, uh, distros. Mm -hmm. um, you can just check those. And if not, you have to enable. I think most of them now have that enabled. Uh, yep. Is it possible to filter the output of ftrace to follow a single device driver that is running on the system? How does that work? Um, usually, you don't, I, I mean, you can filter, you can do different kinds of filter. You can filter by um, function. So you can just say, I want, to see, I, I want to just see only those functions. I want those five functions on that. So yes, like if you just want to debug a driver, you can filter by their functions. And you can also filter by module. So you have a .c file, that's a module, and then you can filter by that. You can enable, I want to see just the functions from that kernel driver, that .c file. So, so yes. In my example, I have done the debug at the process level. So I ask the trace MD to debug that user space application. Um, so in this trace, I have all of the functions called at the kernel level um, from this process ID. That's what that was the future that was created here by trace MD. But yeah, you can change, as I mentioned, by function, by file. By subsystem, so it's yeah pretty much flexible. I think we have one more question here. Do we have any limitation or disadvantages of Valgrind? Yes, Valgrind will run the software like five times over uh, because it will uh, Valgrind the way it works to. Um, capture problems in memory. The way it works is that it will emulate the software. It's kind of like of QMU. It will emulate the software, your application that it has, like the implementation of syntax, synthetic CPUs inside of it. And that means it, the software will run pretty much slower. So if you don't care about that, usually when you are debugging like memory allocations or deadlocks. Uh, you might not care about the speed of 
the execution, the execution speed of the application. But sometimes you might care about that. Sometimes the, 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 the execution is important, the, the speed. And you want really execute the application, not emulate the application. And then you might want to use other tools for to debug in a specific problem. Um, then Valride might might not be the right tool for you. You just need, need to be aware of that. The software will run slower. That's the trade-off. So, okay. Uh, just two more questions. Um, uh, there are some scenarios where drivers don't care about function return values, and so can silently fail. How does one catch that? If the silent failure bites us much after it actually happened. Not sure if I follow the question. So you have a function that doesn't have a return. And if it fails, maybe it's a problem in the design of the function because if it doesn't have a return in theory, it, it doesn't want to report a failure. Um, so I'm not sure if I understood that question. Can you rephrase that? Return values are not checked in some cases. Oh, okay. So the return values are not checked. So the function has return values, but they are not checked. And the question is how to debug that? Yes, I think that that is the question. So it's essentially, I think the question is about silent failures, meaning mm -hmm. you do not have a good cookie crumbs as you're going by and trying to debug the problem. You don't have a um, you don't always know, um, you don't have enough information to say this is yeah. what could have happened. I would say the best tool for that is GDB, um, like doing an interact because you don't, you cannot collect information. You don't have information. It's just failing, right? That's in the, that category of logic problems where the software just fail, but you don't have much information about it. So I would just run step by step the code to try to get to the function that is failing, but not like providing any feedback. Right, and then in some cases, if you if the problem goes away, D GDB sometimes you cannot reproduce the problem. If the problem is not reproducible through GDB, you have to find other ways to uh, figure out what's happening. Especially if it's GDB is issue, yeah. right. GDB is useful, I would think that in cases where, uh, for analysis, it's useful. Sometimes it's not always useful uh, Useful to reproduce the problem. I think that's that would be accurate to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I would agree. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, Dhruva, hopefully that answered your question. If not, come back to us. I have a couple of more questions. Is this okay to ask? Looks like they have couple of more questions. I mean, how is it going in terms of, do you want to differ these questions? For yeah, maybe maybe I, could, I could move, yeah, move on a little bit and then. Okay, you can sounds good. Question, yeah. So we'll get back That's... to your questions, just hang on. Yeah, good. So here I have a few more examples on user, on tracing, but on user space tracing. Um, there are two tools that I like to use at the user space level for tracing. Uh, one of them, actually two, S-Trace, Alitrace. trace S traces a tool to trace system calls. L traces a tool to trace library calls. And uh, those tools are usually very, like it's, uh, it's easy to use and it's very helpful. So it's a tool that can help you to understand what a binary is doing, to understand the result of the execution of a binary. Um, in this kind of situation, that, that question, like uh, the, you run a specific software and then it just fails, but it don't provide you any feedback. Maybe uh, S-Trace can help you on that because S-Trace is going to show you all the system calls. And then you can see like, for example, let's say uh, an application tries to open a configuration file. The configuration file is not there, then it fails, but it doesn't show you any message. So with S-Trace, you can see that, right? So it's very, very useful. Here I have an example with this um, Netcat application. I just added a bug there. You run Netcat and then it fails. Couldn't set up listening socket. For some reason, you cannot listen to this 
uh, TCP ports. And then if you run with S trace, you're going to see all system calls executed. Um, and then if you go down, like from the, the, the bottom up, then you can see the message. If you go up, you can see the error. So this is the call, bind, return it, this error, bad address, and then you got this message. Then you, here you can see that the bind call fi failed. And if you look at the interface for the bind call, you're going to see that this parameter is missing. You are passing new here, but should not be new. So we have now a good indication of why the software is failing. So there is a bug in the software that is passing the wrong argument to the bind call. Uh, just by running S trace, you could have this kind of feedback, right? Without opening any source code. And you don't need source code for that because it's just uh, capturing the system calls, parsing that, and showing you the name of the system call, the parameters, and the return. You can have the same thing with L trace, but L trace is for library calls. Um, Yeah, those are two very nice tools. Um, another example here, I'm not going to do this at the terminal um, because it might take a while and I want to cover the last part, GDB stuff. Um, so here I'm using uh, care infrastructure called U-Probe or user space probe to probe user space applications. Because S-Trace and L-Trace can help you debug, uh, trace user space applications, but uh, you cannot use S trace and L trace to trace the functions from the application itself, only the system calls and library calls. If you want to trace the functions from the application itself, you can use uprobe for that. Um, and there are a few tools and scripts that makes it easier to use uprobe because it's not that easy to use it. Um, one tool that I feel it's very easy to use is perf. So here I have a, uh, an example that I created with Perf to trace this ATH2. Um, in the first command here, I am um, adding the trace points. So I have a loop where I'm collecting all trace points from this software and then I'm enabling those trace points. That means I'm taking all of the functions from this uh, binary and adding as trace points in the kernel. So when I run the software, uh, if I have those trace points enabled, the kernel will uh, let me know. Uh, that's the idea here. So I'm enabling the trace of all of the functions inside this software um, with this common line here. Uh, I can see this if I run Perf probe list. I can see all of the probes that I created, that the trace points that I added, and then I can use the perf record to run the application and uh, capture all of those trace points. The result of this will be a perf dot data file with the result of tracing that application. That means all of the functions called from the application um, is going to be inside that file. Then I can use another command from perf, perf script, to parse that. Then I can see all of the functions that was called. I mean, there are lots of different things that I could talk about perf here. You can create a graph, a backtrace, and all that stuff. But just a, a simple example. And um, you can, there are lots of things to explore here. You can, yeah, just try perf. It's a very nice tool, not only for profiling, but also for, for tracing. So those are two kind of uh, techniques that I usually use for tracing user space applications. Let's talk now about interactive debugging. Um, that's, one of the main like techniques that we use for debugging, right? And uh, nowadays, still GDB is our default tool for that. So I want to show you um, two examples of interactive debugging. 
One that the kernel space, there was a question there. Someone asking, can I use GDB at the kernel space? Yes, you can. Let's see it. And one at the user space level. The point here is that you need uh, like a client setup architecture because you have the source code, the tools, the binary with the debugging symbols in your host machine. In your target machine, that's your device, you have only your, the software running. So what you need is a GDB server running on the target device, communicate with a client on your host machine, receiving comments from the client, and execution, e executing um, the instructions on the target. So the client will just say, like, add a breakpoint to this address, run the next line of code, and that stuff and the server will just execute that. Um, so that's how it works. And it happens that the kernel has this kind of a server implementation. Let's call it KGDB. So if you enable KGDB in the kernel, you, you're going to, need to enable config KGDB and uh, a driver for communicating with uh, the KGDB. We usually use the serial port for that. Um, I'm, I want to show you how this works now. So the first thing is to set up the, the infrastructure of communication. And um, since I'm using uh, the serial port for the console, so here I'm connected over the serial port, I cannot just reuse it for GDB. So what I usually do is I use a, a, an agent that will act as a kind of proxy for communicating over the serial port. There is one agent provided by the community called it Agent Proxy. I think it's inside the kernel.org uh, server. And uh, it's a very simple application that will act as a proxy. So you run it uh, telling the serial port of the device and two TCP ports. The first one is for the console. The second one is for GDB. So every communication will pass to this proxy that will distribute the messages. So if it's a GDB message, it goes to GDB. If it's a console message, it goes to the console port. I'm going to use this. If you are not using the serial port for the console, then you don't need this, OK? But I, I am, so I'm going to use it. So I started the proxy. Now I'm going to set up. I have to start a telnet connection in the first port, 5550. You can see now that I'm connected. I'm going to reboot here the device. So I'm in the console, but over telnet. Now I have this infrastructure set up working. I have the kernel with KGDB enabled. Now, now what I can do is just um, put the kernel in the buggy mode. I can do it, that at boot time or at runtime. I'm going to do it at runtime. I created here a, a small shell script to do that for me, but I will show you. So this is the shell script. I need just to set up the parameter for the communication, that's the serial port, and then use this sysrq command to put the kernel in debug mode. So if I run this, now the kernel is in debug mode. It is basically waiting, everything is like freeze it. Now I can connect to the kernel over GDB. Now I go to my and a search code on my host machine. I can start a GDB session using the kernel in L format, the VM Linux image. I'm going to also use the TUI mode for a better visualization. Now what I have to do, connect to the device. So there is a command in GDB, target, remote, what I want to do is to connect to my local host, the proxy that will send a message to the device. So 
So this part here is that's departed for GDB. Now I'm connected to the kernel. So now I can put any breakpoints anywhere in the kernel, including interrupt service routines and debug the kernel. Um, I'm going to debug this problem here. So let me just get one of the functions, this one. So I'm going to put break function. So I added a breakpoint to a function inside the LED framework, LED framework from the kernel. Then I'm going to ask GDB to continue the execution. Uh, you can see here on the console that the execution is frozen. Nothing has happened here, but uh, I can go here, continue. Now the kernel is executing. So if I go there, it's executing. I'm controlling the execution of the kernel. So now I'm going to write to the LED file. Um, let me take the command here, this one. And uh, we're going to see what's going to happen. So um, this garbage that you're seeing here is coming from GDB. Now, if I go to, to GDB, I'm there. Stop it at that function that I added the breakpoint. And then I can run the kernel code step by step. Next, next, next. I can do a backtrace. I can do everything I want at the kernel space. So yes, you can do interactive debugging of the Linux kernel with GDB. It might take a while for you to create this infrastructure, but uh, for complicated problems, that might be very, very helpful. Uh, to finish this interactive topic, I want to just quickly show interactive debugging at the user space level. Um, so I have here another situation, this one. So tree is hanging. So I have here a problem with the tree command that is hanging. I want to debug it. I could trace. That would be one option. Um, I could add print to the code to see what's happening. But I mean, let's do it with GDB. How we can debug this with GDB? Again, it's a client server um, architecture, so I need to start the server on the target and run the client on the host. And that is a common GDB server for that. So GDB server, and then you, you say like the connection and the command. So I'm asking GDB server, please open a port one, two, three, four to debug this tree slash var command. And it's there waiting for a connection. Then now I go um, what is this? Okay, I'll close it. Now I go to the search code of the application yield this is the search code. So I need the search code of the application. I need a toolchain, GDB from my toolchain, and I need the application with debugging symbols. That's what I need. Then I start GDB with my application. I'm going to use three modes because it's nice. So I open the application with GDB. Now I connect to the target. To connect to the target, target remote. Now I'm will connect to the IP address of the target. That in my case is so I'm doing this. Um, so we saw in the kernel that I use the serial port to transport the communication. Now I'm using an a Ethernet connection. So it's network here. So I will use the IP address of the device and the port that I use it there. Now I'm connected. It is stopped at the first line of the code. And since I didn't load the symbols from libraries, I cannot see like the source here. But I don't care about this. I just want to put a break at the main function, break main, and then continue the execution. And now I'm debugging the software. So I can run it line by line. Since it is hanging, I can just continue the execution. 
wait a few seconds, control C to stop it, and then we can see the line that is hanging. There is a column there that should not be there. I can see that you have 15 minutes. I want to finish the presentation, so just a few more slides, and then we can open for questions until the end of the presentation. Um, so to finish, the bugging framework. So I, that's the name that I give for this kind of tools. It's not formal. Um, when you create a tool to debug some kind of problem, like you create an infrastructure to debug that. So uh, there are several um, debugging frameworks in Linux kernel to debug memory leaks, to debug um, hangs, lookups in the kernel. There are frameworks at the user space level. Valgrind is one of them. So a few examples. The kernel has, let's say you run a command and the kernel just like it's freezing. It's not executing, like it's hanging. Um, the kernel has lookup detectors that can detect most of the situations where code just hang at kernel space. If you enable that, that's usually not really recommended for production systems because it adds some overhead. Uh, but for debugging, you can enable it, no problem. And then when you run something that hangs at kernel space, um, after a few seconds, usually 30 seconds, 30 something, you're going to see a kernel ops. And uh, it's a kernel ops, like any other kernel ops. You're going to see the problem, solve to look up. You're going to see the program counter, the function that uh, hanged. You can take this information. And then uh, with the Linux kernel source code and the R2 chain, you can find out the line of code that's causing the, the hang. This is using Valgrind. So I have a problem there in this command CPU load. Uh, and I have problem with memory leaks and I want to debug that. So I added Valgrind to the system. And I want uh, Valgrind to solve symbols for me. So I also updated the, the program with debugging symbols. If you don't do that, Valgrind is uh, it's still able to find the issue, but it is not able to solve symbols. So it will not say to you like which line of code that allocated memory that was not deallocated. But it still works. If you have these possibilities better to update the binary with the button symbols to run it with Valgrind. And then you run Valgrind. There are a few parameters there. I usually use this one for memory leaks. Leak check equal full and the program. Then you leave the program running for some time. You close it and then Valgrind will generate a report for you as soon as it is finished. And then you're going to see like information about the leaks. So in this case, I definitely lost. That means I allocated and didn't allocate anywhere. Nine times this size here, 36K of RAM. And then it generates a backtrace from the leaks. So this function do start, call it the print CPU load, that call it malloc, and this malloc was not free. And if you open this, you, you're going to see um, the root cause of the leak. So if you run Valgrind with binary debugging symbols, you're going to see this kind of information that is very useful. Source code and lines of code. If you don't, you're going to have to solve the symbols uh, on the host. host. You can do that. Um, Very good. So 
my conclusion here to open for questions is um, when you start our career, it's very common for us to use only one technique for debugging that's adding prints to the code. And when I say print, adding prints to the code, maybe you are not even adding prints to the code, but like you are, you instrument the code somehow, right? Sometimes you don't have a way to see a print. So you, you blink an LED, right? So you use an LED as a way to provide your feedback and then you, you, you do this interactively, right? Like you, you, you change the code. Like if I pass here, I'm gonna blink this LED. The fact that, uh, like, instrumenting the code, it's only one technique, uh, and we need to understand. And most of the times, try to identify the best approach for the best situation for the best problem. So for those that are starting, try to learn more about all of those tools. Um, for those that are not starting like me, I'm learning every day about new tools. Things are always improving and I'm always learning about new techniques and tools. Um, and that's very important to try to always improve the way we do things to be more productive. So this slide shows like for every kind of problem, we might have different options or um, and a specific technique might be better. Just as a, a simple example, interactive debug is very bad for performance analysis because it might probably impact the performance of the system if you run it step by step, line by line. Uh, so it's not good for that specific case. Instrumenting the code, depending on the situation, uh, you might, like when you instrument the code, you might change the behavior. And the simplest fact that you add a print to the code, you, you will change the execution time and that might hide problems. So tracing, for example, might not be good in some situations. Uh, so yeah, my point here, is exactly that. Uh, there are several different techniques and tools. I show you a few of them during the presentation. Try to explore them. Uh, we really just scratched the surface. There are lots of stuff. I mean, this material is from my three day training on this talk. Uh, and I could really turn this into a five day training if I want. So there are lots of stuff to talk about um, debugging and tracing and performance analysis on Linux. So I hope all of this was helpful. Um, let me open for questions uh, until the end of the presentation now. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, let, I'll start with the question in the Q&A box. How can we extract the trace log in case of kernel panic when the system gets stuck? Good question. So the kernel has a feature uh, to persist, a feature called pstore to persist logs. Um, if you want that, you might want to have a look. Pstore. So this is a framework that you can uh, use to persist kernel logs, um, to persist F-trace buffers um, to analyze later. It has this kind of uh, architecture where you can define the, um, the, the place that you, you want to store this. Usually, of course, it is a persistent storage device, like a flash device, but you might also want to use memory. So if you have a kind of a soft reset, you can, for example, on ARM, you go to the device tree, you reserve a part of the memory for, for a P store, and then uh, that part of the memory will be used to persist logging. And, and then if you have a soft reset, let's say a kernel panic with a reboot, 
the next reboot, you are able to collect the the kernel ops message from the previous uh, boot. So have a look at P star. Um, there is one question that might be this could be the very last question probably. Sometimes GDB um, backtrace shows corrupt stack frame. Why? Hmm. Um, again, some kind of uh, weird optimization done done by by the compiler. Um, you might have, for example, security flags enabled when you compile the software, and uh, the security flags might add some specific logic to handle the stack frames. And that might confuse GDB. That's the whole point, because you don't want to see the stack. Um, so that might be one of the reasons. Um, optimizations or security flags that was enabled when the software was compiled. A few reasons that might cause those corrupted frames um, that you see on GDB. Okay, I think that's about, I, I tried to, um, okay, last question. Um, Candice, how are we doing on time? Um, we have two minutes left? Yep, we're good. Okay. Um, how to debug corrupted kernel memory while JTAG probe watch point support is not available? Uh, can you repeat, please? Um, yes. How to debug corrupted kernel memory while JTAG probe watch point support is not available. Hmm. The kernel has a, the only way I know to, to debug in this situation is, is by using a feature from the kernel called KDB. So KDB is a built-in debugger in the Linux kernel. It's not related to KGDB. So it doesn't use GDB. It's a built-in a built-in debugger in the Linux kernel um, that you can use to debug at the assembly or machine level. So you can enable KDB, and um, as soon as it has some kind of crash, it will pop up a KDB prompt. So you can debug memory. You can really manipulate everything, like in memory and process everything. Um, so if the your the problem that you're having is not doesn't impact the behavior of kdb then you can use it to debug this kind of situation um that's the only way i see if you don't have the jtag uh, for that so i one last question about uh being able to debug threads can we can you debug each kernel thread independently, not each CPU, but each thread? I'm saying you're thinking kernel thread, thread I'm thinking it's yeah. not a CPU thread. A kernel thread? Right. Um, yes, I mean, yes, you can. Um, as soon as you attach it to the to KGDB, you can add breakpoints to a specific threads to symbols from threads um, and debug it. Um, so I have never had problems with that. I, yeah, you can, as you can do at user space level, you can also do at the kernel space level for sure. What I found impressive is that you can even do with interrupt service routine. So at the interrupt context, uh, you can you can debug and run the code step by step. So. If you can do that at the, the interrupt constant, for sure you can do that at the kernel thread level. Great. I think that's all we have um, as for questions. Thanks. Thank you um, for doing this session. Lots of good questions. Candice, Thank back you. to you. Perfect. Thank you, Sergio and Sushiwa, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.
As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation's website. We hope you join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.